Uh, hello, everyone. I guess we can start now. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Sergei Shiluhin. Uh, I am with Hornworks, uh, working in uh, working on a Hive Apache Hive project, and then. Uh, I was supposed to have a co-speaker today. Unfortunately, he did not come to Dublin, so it's just me. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, LLAP, uh, which is uh, an acronym for Live Long and Process. Uh, and it's uh, basically a platform that uh, whose primary purpose uh, is to allow Hive to execute sub-second analytical queries. Uh, and uh, it has other uses, too. So we basically will go through uh, what is LLAP, what in particular does it uh, optimize, how does it do that, and then we are going to go through uh, what other users does it have as a unified data layer, and uh, how to, uh, what is the current situation with deploying and managing it if you want to try it out. So this talk is kind of uh, more technical, although it does have a bunch of examples and like performance benchmarks and stuff like that. Uh, so what is LLP? LLP is basically uh, a platform, uh, you know, I mean, many, many people here are probably familiar with MapReduce and Tez and how this all works. Uh, when you write a query which is translated into a distributed algorithm, basically, which is executed upon uh, a series of containers. So LLP uh, expands that with a hybrid model where uh, you can execute the uh, computations in containers, but you can also execute computations inside the persistent daemons. Uh, and as it turns out, as you could probably learn from uh, the experience with MPP systems, having persistent execution daemons uh, gives you a number of advantages uh, with regard to concurrency, uh, with regard to uh, caching, uh, you, and uh, additionally it solves uh, some problems that are specific to Hive, such as efficiently doing I.O. Uh, and uh, then, well, after you already have the demons, you find out that you can also use those as uh, kind of, uh, if you imagine, like a data node that understands uh, relational concepts like tables and rows and columns. Uh, so that is the future development for uh, LLAP. So just a small clarification for people who are more familiar with uh, the innards of Hive and uh, like SQL and Hadoop in general. Uh, what LLAP isn't, LLAP is not uh, an execution engine, so it does not replace MR, Spark, Tez, uh, any execution engine can hypothetically run on LLAP. And also it doesn't as in, in itself act as a data storage, it merely uh, is a substrate for reading the data from other sources like HDFS or Azure uh, file system or S3, uh, etc. Uh, so as a technical overview, uh, you can basically, uh, if you think about container execution, you know you have node manager and all the M MR, TES, Spark uh, jobs come around and execute containers. Uh, inside of LAP, instead of containers, you execute fragments. So inside of it, it has uh, like execution slots, which are kind of like containers, uh, where you can put your own computations that uh, are uh, processing data the same way the containers are. And they have all the same uh, kind of interfaces. Uh, they can read data from HDFS, HBase, uh, other file systems, and write the data to all kinds of streaming and uh, uh, in-place uh, destinations. In addition, uh, it also has, uh, or it will have shortly, a, an API which is specific to this daemon, which allows you to basically read data without uh, submitting much of a computation, basically just kind of a data API. Uh, and uh, streaming the data out of it with this data API. Uh, so you basically, uh, there's a queue of things, you put things in the queue to execute it according to some algorithms which favors uh, the queries that are shorter by default. Uh, you, it takes them out of the queue, it executes them, you get the data. Uh, inside of it, there's also an I.O. layer, which basically uh, consists of two main things, the synchronous I.O. and caching. I will go through some details about the I.O. layer later, so I'm going to be brief here. Basically, you just have a separate thread for I.O. which uses caching and which eats the data from different sources. Uh, so, now, so hypothetically, we have those demons running now, and they are running uh, some computations. Uh, because it's uh, part of the Hive project, obviously it uses Hive primitives for uh, the computation. Uh, so the question, how does the Hive integration actually work? Uh, and uh, Hive integration right now only works on Tez engine. Uh, and it's completely invisible, transparent, or opaque. I actually don't know how to say this correctly. I think it's transparent to the user. The user doesn't see anything. 
uh, except the queries suddenly become faster, uh, which is good. Uh, and uh, you use, uh, you would typically use Hive Server 2 as you normally do, and Hive Server 2 will uh, control the number of concurrent queries. And then those queries launch uh, application managers, and application managers submit uh, work to either containers or LLP. The queries can run either entirely in containers, entirely in LLP, or a combination of uh, those two. Uh, we have found out so far that it's usually best to run the queries entirely in LLP, but there are obviously exceptions, and the most notable ones are security-related. Uh, if you are submitting user code, for example, obviously you don't want to run it in a daemon with everyone else. Uh, and TESAM uh, coordinates the query uh, as it coordinates the existing query with containers. Obviously, there are some differences, but uh, the idea is the same. And the fragments are basically parts of Hive uh, execution pipeline with operators like selects, joins, filters, etc., uh, that run inside the daemon. Uh, now, how does this all? Why, how does this, how does this help? So how does this help? I kind of went through this uh, a little bit first of all, and it's kind of uh, uh, an obvious one. It doesn't, you don't have to start containers anymore, which saves a lot of cost. Uh, first of all, because the GVM is just expensive to start, and second, because uh, the cold GVM is actually much slower than the hot GVM. And if you're running the same kind of code, for example, the same Hive operators, uh, it's actually even faster because uh, JIT optimizer uh, optimizes your code and like inline things uh, as it runs longer. There's asynchronous I.O. caching, some data can be shared if it's in the same daemon and several fragments are running from the same kind of, uh, from the same job. For example, if you have a hash join and the hash table is loaded inside the daemon, you have multiple processors running for the same query. They can all share the same read-only hash table. You don't, they don't have to load it like six times uh, as is the case with containers. Uh, so we run some, I'm going to go through benchmarks quickly, usually they are placed at the end of the presentation, but they're actually in the beginning in my case. Uh, so this is like an industry standard be benchmark, which you could probably guess is TPCDS. Uh, and so it speeds up queries to various extents running with, uh, versus existing Hive. Some queries are sped up as much as 90%, some queries are sped up less, but basically it's a pretty massive speed up at the current version. Uh, and from the benchmarks, we actually have, uh, as f in Hortonworks, we have some customers who are eager to try this to speed up their queries, even though it's not quite production ready yet. So we have some real use case example. Uh, the speed up is not as impressive, and in this case, we actually ran, uh, ran the queries is uh, old Hive on TES versus Phoenix versus LLP. So for a simple query like an aggregation of statistics for a day in a graph, uh, you see that LLP actually runs queries much faster than, uh, especially for large ranges, much faster than in Phoenix, uh, which is kind of surprising uh, for a simple query. Uh, and uh, also, it has less variability, so like maximum time to run a query was uh, significantly lower than, uh, for example, on TES. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah. And the, from, the same kind of, uh, from the same kind of use case, we are running uh, a, actually a more complicated report, for which I couldn't anonymize the query enough to provide it here. But uh, basically, uh, Phoenix is not displayed because the report involves joins, and the joins are not the strong side of Phoenix of the current version. Uh, so LAP uh, here, it actually achieves almost sub-second timing on a pretty complicated report, uh, which is uh, impressive, uh, and which is our eventual goal is to get to that sub-second magic uh, kind of human, human, human performance, human scale queries. Uh, so now I'll go a little bit into the details of how it all works. Uh, we had a, saw a summary slide earlier. Uh, so first of all, some recap for the persistent daemon optimizations that I've already mentioned, the sharing, the startup time, and the optimizer. And some, uh, they're not really micro benchmarks, I guess mini benchmarks. So first of all, the performance of the first query, and that must be familiar to every, anyone who's ever done ad hoc analytics on Hive. You start up your Hive shell or CLI or Beeline, you run the first query, it takes forever. You run the second query, it's slightly faster. You run the third, oh, so actually, second query is much faster, the third query is slightly faster yet, and now basically like this little, uh, ramp up of the Hive uh, pipeline. So in this case, uh, TES already has container pre-warm uh, uh, feature which allows uh, you to start containers before you run the query. Unfortunately, due to some restrictions like no sharing, for example, it's kind of hard to use in real production environments. So I've compared all the features here. Cold LAP is uh, kind of obviously pretty much as fast as uh, warm TES containers because it's already there. A realistic LLP where you warm it up. Well, basically somebody has been running workloads and uh, it's warm now 
and uh, you run your own unrelated workload, it's still much faster. And it's three times faster than just running a query. For this example query, it's three times faster than running a query on a cold hive with like no containers. Uh, and if you run a repeated query, I have to uh, take uh, like a special like note. In this case, the cache was disabled, so it's not the optimization from having the data in cache. As you can see, if you run a repeated query on either cold LAP or warm LAP because of inlining and other optimizations with JIT, and like the code is getting loaded, uh, you get a performance benefit. Uh, if you run the same query repeatedly, it's larger, but even if you have uh, if you have LLP with somebody who's running workloads, because a lot of the Hive code, like operators and stuff, is already warm, uh, you'll get benefits just from that. Uh, so now parallel queries. Parallel queries are actually pretty interesting, and that's another big motivation for having this infrastructure in place, is that it's really hard to properly run parallel queries in containers. Uh, so because in this case we are inside the daemon where it's much easier to manage workloads and uh, we are also aware of like what's, unlike Yarn, we are mostly aware of what's going on and what belongs to what workload. Uh, we can do a number of optimizations. For example, we can queue the work in proper order. So if you have like a huge ETL job running, it does not uh, shut out every interactive query that's out there and interactive queries will get like a fast lane. And we can even preempt the work that is uh, less important, uh, especially as a, like if you use pipelining in Hive, you have some queries that start containers that do not do anything for a while so that you would have like get some input data. Uh, these containers can be killed in order to make way for interactive queries otherwise uh, that otherwise would have been stalled be behind them. So, and uh, the parallel query chart is a little bit hard to read. Actually, I think I'm missing a slide or they're in the wrong order. How did this happen? Oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's how it's supposed to be. First of all, it's just LLP. So as you can see, we, we tried it with a number of users on, a, on a, like a single query, a single data set, and uh, up, to, uh, up to some number of users, it exhibits almost linear scaling. So you get like, if you run twice as many users, you'll get twice as much performance. Eventually, it does start to go downhill, but uh, if you compare it to the previous slide, which was supposed to be next, uh, and this actually compares it to running on existing Hive on containers. And you see like the green chart here, it like goes all the way down there. Uh, and we have just much bigger query runtimes on uh, Hadoop, but even query runtimes notwithstanding, uh, you see that uh, the, the scaling on containers goes off the charts like down uh, almost immediately. Like by the time you hit four users, you already have uh, half the efficiency has been lost. Whereas LAP at this point is still at 90% of linear scaling. So it is interesting because we actually have not done much work yet for specifically addressing as a parallel query use case. But even with existing, uh, existing infrastructure, we're already seeing a huge improvement in parallel queries. Uh, so. Now the next uh, major optimization that I was talking about is uh, I.O. elevator and caching. Uh, so one uh, Hive specific problem is that Hive reads the data and processes the data in a single thread by default, which I don't know if you guys knew that, but that's actually kind of embarrassing. Uh, so now we have an uh, infrastructure to actually, well, I mean, obviously it's not like 100% li uh, linearized. Uh, there is obviously background reading and processing, but uh, uh, now we have proper asynchronous reading where one thread would read the data and uh, potentially multiple threads, and then one thread would process the data uh, asynchronously. Uh, we also have caching, which is uh, logically compressed in case of ORC, it's just encoded data. Uh, we're caching metadata, which is pretty important uh, because for the queries which have like restrictive filters and you're like eliminating a lot of data, you don't want to hit the disk. Uh, on certain file systems, like for example S3 and Azure, hitting the disk for metadata can be extremely expensive, so it's good to have the, da the metadata uh, in memory. And uh, the caching uh, can help some workloads, but the disclaimer is that for some workloads it may not be as useful, obviously, and it's kind of a trade-off because Hive needs memory to process the data and you need to have a, like a good trade-off between cache and executors. Uh, sometimes, you, especially on modern boxes, when you have a lot of memory, you can say I'm gonna use, uh, I'll, I'm going to give executors that much memory that makes sense, like four or six gigs per, and then allocate the rest for cache, so that could be a good starting point. And uh, this is actually the details of the IO elevator, which is basically in-memory uh, processing in Hive, you could call that. Some of this is work in progress. Uh, so basically, there is a, we are reading the data, uncompressing the data, and storing it in cache. And then we can read the data from cache and decode it into vectorized batches and do the native Hive vectorized processing. 
Uh, so it's operating on, like, it's cutting out of overhead from uh, just standard Hive processing. Uh, we have several improvements over that in progress, like actively being worked on. First of all, this is cache, which may not make sense if you have on-prem HDFS, but which makes a lot of sense if, you, but it may make sense if you have on-prem HDFS too, but more sense it makes if you have, uh, if you have a cloud-based deployment, because cloud-based file systems are, it would usually be slower than on-prem, uh, so caching data on local disk actually makes sense, especially if it's SSD. And we also have some experiments with low-level processing, like, for example, pushing filters all the way down to I.O. level instead of doing them in the uh, operator level, which is cheaper. Uh, I.O. level is cheaper than operator level. And the bright future, which uh, may happen at some point, well, which we hope to realize, is that uh, we eliminate entirely the decoding layer and operate directly on the data in cache. Uh, which would both uh, get rid of like copying and decoding step during uh, the execution and also will allow us to have uh, basically low level native processing inside Hive, which is uh, even better than the existing uh, vectorized processing where we convert the data into uh, Java primitives. Uh, and that also opens up venues for like even a distant future improvements like code gen, code gen and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, I mentioned multiple times, so this is actually an example of running just one query on an industry standard uh, cloud file system which shall not be named. Uh, and uh, we are running uh, a query on a t on a one terabyte data set and it's a large scan. Uh, and we have a local, uh, so we have a local uh, uh, SSD cache, uh, it's actually a type or it should say SSD. Uh, that is work in progress, but in this case, it's just using the in-memory cache, and uh, the data, a lot of data happens to fit in memory uh, because the scan obviously filters a lot. And so the first time you run a query, uh, oh, sorry, because the cluster is large and the scan filters a lot, so most of the data for the query fits in memory. And the first time you run a query, it takes some like insane number, like several minutes, and most of it is just scanning the data. And then the second, after you run, when you run a query with cache already warm, it only takes about uh, 45 seconds or 35 seconds, and the scan is a small portion of that. Uh, and this is an example of cache performance on HDFS. This is another kind of complicated chart, but basically what the gist of it is that uh, this ch the x uh, axis is the cache size, and as the cache size goes up, the cache hit ratio for the query goes up, and uh, the query time goes down slightly. Uh, the orange line above is an example of when you have the cache with unrelated data. So the query, uh, like, query sp speeds up a tiny bit for the uh, larger cache sizes, probably because of some uh, like rare metadata hits, but uh, the cache gives you benefit even on HDFS. Uh, oh, how did this happen? Oh, and I have a demo. I have a demo that is so small it fits in an animated GIF. Uh, so here we're running a query on uh, Hive on Tez. Uh, and it's running and it's running. Uh, it's a little bit of a pause here. You see, it starts to become uh, the reducer mapper start to complete. So it takes 10 seconds. Uh, now we enable LLP, and there was uh, almost no cheating involved in this benchmark. There is no pre-warmed cache. There is nothing like that, and the query just completes instantly in one in less, less than one second. Uh, so uh, yeah, so that's it for performance for today. Uh, now let's talk about the potential future for LLP. Uh, and then I'll touch on the installation and deployment after that if you want to play with uh, this uh, product before it actually comes out in uh, any vendor distribution. Uh, so when you have the demons running, you start to, to wonder, like, for example, if you have Hive Metastore, uh, you, if you have Hive Metastore, you know that Hive Metastore is being used by H Catalog, it's being used by Pig, it's being used by even uh, other products like Impala. Uh, to get the data about the table. So if you have the demons running, you wonder who else might use this. And you realize you can have a relational data nodes of sorts view of the data. Uh, and you can secure the data, you can have a, uh, basically a centralized uh, access point for in-memory and uh, on uh, disk data. Uh, so, uh, and there are two ways to integrate with that. First one, that one that I already described, the tight integration, if you have something like TES, which has a DAG, so you can schedule your work directly there. And the second one is the API that is work in progress where you can integrate uh, other products uh, with LLP to read the data. And uh, for the example uh, that I'm going to give, I'm going to use Spark SQL, something that we are actually actively working on. Uh, so existing Spark SQL can already read Hive data, but there are several problems with that. Uh, it, reads the direct, uh, it directly reads the data of uh, the file system which means if you're using, for example, SQL standard authorization in Hive or you, uh, you are using Ranger, uh, you are not going to get any performance checks. Uh, so that is kind of problematic. 
And also with new features like, for example, transactional ACID uh, data in Hive, the file structure becomes uh, more complicated than just straight up uh, files with data, like there are delta files. So this may not be supported correctly if there is no feature parity between uh, whatever Spark SQL uses to read the data, like input format, and uh, whatever Hive uses to read the data. And some features like cell level security may not even work. And cell level security is not a moment yet on Hive, but it uh, will be in future. So now we're looking at Spark SQL, and there are actually nice extension points there which allow us to provide both inputs and provide, us compil provide compilation optimizations. So we can actually use the hooks in a Spark SQL compiler to push computation down into LEP. But at the minimum, we can definitely read the data out even if we don't push anything else down there. Uh, so you can create a context uh, which is a kind of a derivative of Spark context, and you can create a data frame which will refer to Hive data. And the way it works, uh, especially in a secure set setup, is that when you create the centralized uh, data, when you create the data frame, it goes to Hive Server 2, and it says, I want to read this data, and that's what I'm going to do. Like, that's a computation I want to push down, for example. And Hive Server 2 will do the permission checks properly, and it will uh, send back the splits for uh, the Spark SQL to use. And the splits will actually be signed with a secret key uh, so that the, uh, like the user cannot modify the splits. He can only submit the splits to cluster, as, at least to LLP as is. And then the Spark executors will submit the splits to LLP, and the LLP will verify that the splits are actually valid, so the permission checks have been done, and like, the user can access the data, and the user can actually run this code. So it's not like some malicious user-defined function, for example. And then the query will run, and it will send the data back using the streaming API, and the Spark can read this data. Uh, so this is work in progress right now, and, uh, but this is basically the future path for integrating other, uh, other uh, products with uh, LLAP. And there is a, another example of TES LLAP integration where TES basically provides a tightly coupled plugins uh, which uh, allow uh, different, uh, so right now TES, you know, uh, you can imagine approximately how TES works and how, for example, MR works uh, while it schedules the work. It has a coordinator, it schedules the task, the tasks talk back, uh, it talks to the tasks, submits some work, the tasks heartbeat, and all this stuff is happening. Uh, so the same thing happens with TES on LAP, except that uh, there are plugins which tell the TES how to talk to LAP to like find out what's going on with the task. Uh, so other products can also do that, although I don't, really, I, I don't really foresee that people would do that, but it is possible and it is uh, uh, definitely achievable. The API is a protobuf, so it is uh, relatively easy to do. Uh, this is a different way to integrate with LLP compared to Spark SQL way. So now let's uh, discuss the current state of the product and uh, how you deploy and manage it. Uh, uh, so first of all, availability, we shipped the first version of two point, in Hive 2.0 in Apache. Unfortunately, we immediately found a couple of bugs that make it uh, hard to use, especially in the most secure setups. Uh, there is going to be a bug fix release of Hive 2.0 uh, soon, 2.0.1. I'm actually a release manager for that, so I, think I foresee it's going to be like in a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, and it will make it uh, production ready. And next version of Apache Hive will have uh, the new features and improvements, and obviously vendor distros will eventually catch up and it will be released hopefully in summer in the, at least the Hortonworks distribution. Uh, so right now we have a solid platform for the basic scenario. You're, you start LAPs on every node in the cluster or most nodes in the cluster or like a fraction of the cluster and you run queries and you can do it in secure clusters so that works. And we are working in, work in progress is to support additional features like ACID, like user, user code management, and uh, hybrid deployments where we have LAP and containers working together with reasonable rebalancing and uh, like uh, of different approaches. Uh, and the next step will be the unified data access layers that I was talking about. So general overview, we are using, so there are several prerequisites to have LAP right now on Hive. One of them is TES, as I already mentioned. We use Zookeeper for service discovery uh, and coordination, so you need Zookeeper, which almost everyone has now. Uh, we are using Slider to run on Yarn. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Apache Slider. It's basically a framework, to, like a library to package containers and run long running services on Yarn. Uh, so one caveat is that we don't recommend using DoS storage-based authentication uh, in secure cluster, uh, sorry, storage-based authorization in secure clusters, uh, and uh, it's uh, better with SQL OS Ranger. And we recommend using Java 8, because all the JIT benefits and GC benefits I was talking about, they actually work much better in Java 8, and Java 7 is end of life, so it shouldn't be used. <laughs> um, 
So we, uh, we are working right now on onBody integration for LAP, so onBody will be able to deploy all this for you. Uh, but as for now, uh, you can run, uh, there's basically a command line tool uh, included with Hive, Hive Service LAP, which will prepackage the slider, slider package for you and create a script where you just run uh, a script without any parameters and it starts a cluster and you have the cluster. I don't actually know why I put so many instructions on the slides, so I'm not gonna read them, but you can see basically that you can, this, it's like kind of like a extract of the doc of the command line tool that you use to create the package. Uh, and as I have to, I have to repeat that uh, Ambari uh, very soon will be able to do this for you, so you won't have to uh, mess with all those settings. And uh, every user can have his own LAP clusters that are named within the user, namespaced inside the user, so like multiple users can start multiple clusters and they can function independently. Uh, we have a UI for monitoring inside each daemon. Uh, you can, uh, right now there is no aggregate UI, but you can go into each daemon and check out how it's doing, what is it running, what is the cache hit ratio, what's the memory parameters and uh, stuff like that. And I think in Hive 2.1 we will have the aggregate UI which will allow you to monitor the LAP cluster as it is running. Uh, you can also, am I missing the slide again? Uh, somehow oh, the order of my slides changed occasionally, I'm sorry. Uh, so, well, after that you have run LAP, again, this is a little bit of an extract from a doc, you have to set several parameters in Hive to use LAP, which obviously is disabled by default right now. Uh, you, it's recommended that you set several perf settings for Hive, which I recap here, like vectorization and uh, uh, map join is a helpful perf setting and uh, org ORC uh, file format. And then you can just run the queries and you can see how it works uh, and uh, see how much faster it is for you. And, uh, oh, and for interactive, if you're running this, if you happen to actually deploy it in production or in like in the, in the evaluation cluster and you're using some BI tool like Tableau to run the queries, uh, we recommend right now that you disable uh, cost-based optimizer uh, in uh, Hive for those queries because we actually reached the point with those queries where compilation takes longer than running the query. So a compilation may be a bottleneck. And for the same reason, we recommend that you enable parallel query compilation in Hive Server 2 which is a new feature in Hive 2, which is uh, the same thing is that you'll get bottlenecked on compilation uh, because the queries are running faster than you're compiling them, especially if they're not compiled in parallel. Uh, so yeah, and we have test UI integration right now. It's kind of uh, in the early stages, but you can already, uh, when you're looking at, uh, so this is a screenshot from test UI when I'm looking at some queries that I have run. Uh, and uh, I can see the, if I, if I zoom onto the, one of the mappers aside from existing counters, I actually removed the existing counters so it would fit on the slide. Uh, you can basically see LAP counters and you can see that this mapper had like 75% cache hit rate and uh, some other useful or less than useful numbers. Uh, so that is the current state of the UI integration. Uh, so security, I will be uh, relatively brief. It uses all the standard Hadoop uh, security approaches such as Kerberos and tokens. And uh, we, like LAP itself, similar to data node, is running with a key tab. Uh, and uh, right now the secure setup is kind of painful. We have it documented, but uh, Ambari uh, work to s make the setup automatic is uh, in progress. Uh, so basically uh, you won't need to do any of the setup in a short order, but for now you'll have to like distribute key tabs and uh, do the similar steps that you would do for data node and uh, for name node in order to secure LLP. Uh, and the work I was talking about earlier for signing the fragments, for uh, doing the secure work, is that's work in progress together with the main uh, unified data layer, uh, uh, unified data layer work. So, uh, let me just summarize and go through some future work that we are doing or thinking of doing. Uh, so the future work is uh, something that I, I was talking about a lot in this talk is, is the integration for ecosystem, like for example, Ambari integration and uh, other such uh, things. Uh, and there's also the unified data layer work for external services like Spark SQL. And uh, after that, we're thinking about tackling hybrid deployments of LAP and uh, container workloads and uh, specific feature work and more performance work. So the summary of the key takeaways of the talk is that LAP is uh, basically an execution substrate uh, which uh, provides uh, faster uh, memory, faster execution for analytical queries and workloads uh, through caching and uh, other optimizations and uh, uh, in future, it will provide the unified data access layer for Hive and uh, other products like Spark SQL. Uh, 
Uh, it is available in Hive 2, uh, and better integration with the ecosystem is uh, in the works. So I encourage you, if you have the needs to run interactive queries on Hive and you're looking for solutions, uh, to consider uh, playing with it. Uh, and if you're using, for example, Hortonworks Distro, you can just ask your uh, contact to uh, introduce you to it. But uh, in any way, I, can, uh, I guess I'm biased because I'm one of the developers, so it's easy for me to set up, but the setup is reasonably easy in Hive 2 dis distribution, so you can play with it even on your local machine. Uh, so that's it. I think it's too late to go to Hortonworks booth to ask questions because it's <laughs> closed. But I copy pasted the slides, so. <laughs> so if you have any questions, you can ask me. Yeah. Is it, is it faster than Impulse? That's a good question. Uh, generally speaking, I would expect it to be slightly slower than Impala at this point, but we have actually seen workloads in like real workloads that, we, that the customers were running where it was beating Impala on some queries. So we understand that. Uh, Basically, yeah, like we are, we are, we are, it's not standing in place. We are trying to get as close to Impala as possible. But uh, I think the key takeaway is that uh, it's uh, at the point where we get to a certain uh, speed of the queries, like when you get to sub-second, uh, you start to have uh, to wait. Uh, like when you have a query that runs in, in a, like two seconds and a query that runs in like two minutes, the, then it's a major problem, right? When you have a query that runs in half a second and a query that runs in 300 milliseconds, then the other consideration might, uh, might be more important than performance. But yes, we actually have seen, the, which we actually surprised us of all people, but we saw the workloads where, where it was actually outperforming Impala on some queries. Especially the large queries that Impala is not uh, known to be like optimal for, like large joins, large shuffles, and stuff like that. Why you run? Uh, so do you have some performance benchmarks? But why you use G1 garbage collectors to present to the DNS, for example? Or <coughs> some particular use cases that your G1 use of some general array? It's uh, so that's that came, that mostly came from the. Uh, practical uh, performance testing and observing how, observing the behavior of G1 and observing the behavior of CMS, we found that G1 gives uh, much smaller pauses. So it is important in a sense, so uh, the, common, the, common, uh, the common understanding is that G1 gives you more pauses but shorter pauses. And uh, so it, it, in aggregate, it can even g result in more GC time. But we actually have observed that uh, G1 can, g can give you less GC, GC times than CMS and aggregate. And it's especially important that it gives you much shorter pauses, uh, which is good for interactive queries. Uh, because if like a giant CMS pause hits one query, it could be like if you have a query that runs in 900 milliseconds and you hit a uh, CMS pause, which goes for three seconds, you suddenly your runtime is like four times. But if you hit a G1 pause, which is like 100, 200 milliseconds, uh, it is not such a big deal. So it is important for, uh, like for interactive workloads, it's important for uh, kind of stability of your, like le less of the deviation, yeah. In terms of throughput, uh, G1 is like worse than CMS, but... I actually observe that G1 is better than, better than CMS in terms of throughput too, but obviously uh, it depends on the workload. It's, if you go into this level of optimization, you have to test it. You cannot say it from just like, you know, uh, from just get go that something is better or worse. Yeah. Uh, so they are actually not critical in the sense that uh, there, there, are, there are no bugs that will result in data loss or like silent problems with security. All the bugs you'll see immediately. Uh, so it will just uh, like certain secure setups, for example, simply will not work. Like you will like the execution will be rejected. Uh, but these were pretty simple bugs, so they are addressed in the bug fix release. No, that is, uh, it's not uh, there right now. That is future work. Although, no, actually, sorry, we, we are using code generation. It was, it, was provided, it was provided to us by Oracle and uh, OpenGDK and other vendors. <laughs> you can actually look. Uh, so there are tools which allow you to observe like, that it actually inlines the functions and does stuff like that. So we do so. We do, especially with vectorized code, we see some sort of code generation happening. But no, we don't have our own code generation right now.
Any other questions? Who do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, thank you.